Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session of our technology panels uh, at our policy forum. I hope you've been enjoying the expo. We are so glad you're here. My name is Carol Werner. Uh, I'm part of the expo planning committee on the steering committee for the Sustainable Energy Coalition, and I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. So on this panel, we're going to look at a whole range of different technologies, which I think you will find absolutely fascinating. We've got some really, really great people here uh, to talk about all this. So we're going to be covering everything from fuel cells to geothermal to solar, uh, some transportation, waste to energy, and wind. So we're going to be looking across a very, very broad swath. And to kick off our discussion this afternoon is David Giordano, who is the uh, director for federal and state government relations with Doosan Fuel Cell. David? Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, as Carol said, I'm David Giordano with Doosan Fuel Cell, uh, located in South Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, Doosan is a relatively new fuel cell company that in 2014 purchased the assets of a company called Clear Edge Power, which previous to that was UTC Power, United Technologies. United Technologies is, was kind of the grandfather of the fuel cell industry, I would say, in the United States, uh, developing all of the fuel cell technology that you now see today, going back even to the space program on all of the Apollo missions and the space shuttle and, and things like that. Uh, Doosan is a Korean company, the 10th largest conglomerate in Korea, a $22 billion company with 43,000 employees worldwide. It's really a global company, more employees outside of Korea uh, than in Korea, and really a, a good fit for the fuel cell business. They uh, decided to get into this, this industry because fuel cells are a, a, a great application in Korea where land is constrained. Uh, there's not great applications for solar and wind and other uh, renewables, and fuel cells are something that the Korean government has really undertaken. Uh, but Doosan, saying that, Doosan uh, purchased the company really feeling that there was a tremendous market here in the U.S. And fuel cells haven't been on the stationary side, but we do, haven't really been that commercialized uh, until recently, and we're kind of really starting to get, get over the hump. But as I said, Doosan is also a uh, power generation company. Uh, so a, as I said, a really good fit for fuel cells. They develop uh, wind turbines and nuclear plants, and uh, they're into heavy equipment, heavy industry. So just a very good foundation. And we're very happy to be a lot of the folks that I work with at, at the company came out of the fuel cell world in previous iterations with ClearEdge and with UTC, and this is really a tremendous fix. So everybody's, everybody's very excited. We currently employ 275 people in Connecticut, grown from 30 uh, back in July, and the plan is to be over 300 by the end of the year. All of our manufacturing, R&D, uh, engineering uh, takes place at our state-of-the-art facility in, in Connecticut. Um, as I said before, we manufacture a 400 kilowatt stationary fuel cell. So we're not into anything that has to do with transportation uh, that you hear a lot about now. Uh, our primary application is for buildings. So a, kind of a good use of our fuel cell is for um, heavy electric users like hospitals and universities and data centers. Um, but there's a big kind of resiliency power. Our, our resiliency factor, our fuel cells run on natural gas and they run continuous duty all the time, 24-7. Uh, as long as natural gas is, is flowing into the unit, there's a process by which the hydrogen is stripped out. And I'm not an engineer, so I don't, don't hold me to this. I'm the government relations guy. But um, hydrogen is stripped out of the natural gas and turned into electricity and turned into heat. That's goes back into a building. Uh, so we can achieve electrical efficiencies of about 42%. And with the waste heat that we reuse, we can achieve up to 90% uh, efficiency in our from our units. Um, we're a clean, uh, reliable source, very little uh, CO2 emissions, uh, low SOx and NOx emissions and such. such. Um, we don't use any water. We're a traditional uh, gas, natural gas fired, uh, traditional power plant 
requires a lot of water to run. Matter of fact, we produce water that we then reuse in the system for various uh, technical aspects. We currently have uh, 112 of our pure cell, what we call our pure cell model 400s running, operating in the world at 59 sites throughout the world. Most of our units in the US run in places like California and New York, and especially in Connecticut and New Jersey, uh, places that still have, we're still reliant on incentives uh, at the federal level and at the state level. And so there's basically two things that have to be um, have to be in place for us to really be competitive. And that is we have to have high electricity prices and we have to have some kind of incentives. So we're still, we're trying to take a lot of the costs out of these units, but um, we're still quite not there. So we still do rely, unfortunately, on incentives, but someday we'll be, we'll be out of that. Um, we have a pre some of our customers I just get into, and I don't know how much how much more detail. Uh, just wanted to really talk about the company and about the kind of the reliability and resiliency. Spark. Verizon and hot several hospitals and universities are customers of ours, and um, we're we're a, an alternative. We want to be part of energy solutions. We don't want to tout that we're better than necessarily than any other energy solution, but we want to be part of the conversation uh, to come up with an uh, alternative to produce better, cleaner, more reliable energy. Too Great. Long, too short. No, you, you're <laughs> absolutely fine. And um, uh, if, thank you. I think a key thing that does have a real value in terms of an externality is is resilience right. and being able to stand up during all sorts of, right. of things. Right. And so, something I should mention quickly, I have to interrupt, during uh, what we've seen in the Northeast in the last several years between Hurricane Sandy and Winter Storm Albert, Alfred and uh, Hurricane Irene, uh, our fuel cells continued to run because the natural gas continued to flow into them when the power was out. Uh, they continued to run schools and hospitals and supermarkets providing critical need to, to, to people. Uh, use as from an emergency uh, emergency standpoint, but our systems are not designed to be kind of that backup power. They're designed to be a base load power, um, but we run independently of the grid. And as soon as the grid goes down, our systems switch on immediately. So you never you never lose never lose power. Great. I know the first time that I talked to somebody about that feature was years ago. And it was to someone who was running a credit card company yes. and uh, Visa transactions. Right. And they're like, we can't reboot. Right, right, yeah. right. Exactly. So anyway, so thank you very, very much. Um, and we're going to take another switch to a very, very different area now, but also a very, very important provider of base load electricity and but also as a resource that can be used in many many forms and to talk to us about that is Carl Gaywell who is the executive director of the Geothermal Energy Association and someone who has been working on clean energy issues in the forefront as a leader for many many years Carl thank you Carol and it sounds like Wall Street and United Airlines are all learning about reliability the hard way <laughs> Uh, my name's Carl Gaywell, and Ronnie had some copies of what I'm going to say. If anyone wants them, do you have some more left? Do you have any more left? This way you can read it, and I can kind of vary off of it and highlight the things I want to and get done in seven minutes, as, as requested. Um, in any event, I want to appreciate, thank the sponsors for inviting me to come talking about the challenges facing geothermal energy in the state of the industry today. Today, we're producing power in seven western states, 30 countries around the world, and we're developing projects in over 80 countries, which in the last few years has been a tripling of the market for geothermal power worldwide. The fact of the matter is even this amount of usage, which is about 3,500 megawatts in the US and about almost 13 gigawatts worldwide, is still just a fraction of what's possible. The USGS estimated that in the Western United States, just the Western states, there's as much as 75,000 megawatts of conventional geothermal systems. We're talking about hot, heated rock underneath the surface of the earth that you're using to power a power plant, not the heat pumps. And worldwide, the, the potential is just enormous, and it's largely untapped. Many people think of, the, like California, we've got, we're about half of the renewable power in California in terms of output. But even in California, there are substantial resources that are identified. We know where they are. They're not being utilized. And what we're seeing, though, is there's a lot of people looking at geothermal because of all the right reasons. You wondered why we moved from 30 countries to 80. Well, many of those countries are developing countries. 
many of which, as I pointed out in a talk I gave a while ago, have signed the climate treaty. So they're looking at ways to develop power systems without carbon emissions, unlike some other countries we know of. But they're really putting their effort into it, and geothermal, if you have geothermal resources like in Indonesia, the Philippines, Kenya, El Salvador, you're seeing a real push to make major parts of their economy as for their utility system. So why do they support geothermal power? Or all the, I mean, we can go through the litany of reasons, but it's mostly because of it's good quality, power for a utility system, clean, small footprint, low emissions, long lifetime, et cetera. Uh, we won't give you the advertisement. But one of the things that has cha changed is there's been more of an emphasis upon looking what happens when you move to systems with a lot of intermittents. And I'm going to skip ahead to an issue because you can get two papers at our booth, one looking at the values of baseload power, but the other looking at what we call the firm and flexible abilities of geothermal power. Because in the West, today, what we're doing is we're putting a lot of solar and wind on the system. And we're going to continue to do that because they're such good quality, low price units. But what happens is it becomes a premium for firm for ability to be flexible. So you're beginning to see hydropower look at pump storage. You're looking at geothermal, look at how flexible can you be? Can you firm the system? Can you pro provide what's called ancillary services to the power system? And the paper we outlined, we looked at, says definitely yes. In fact, we can outperform natural gas plants in terms of ramping times and speeds. So we see geothermal's future in the United States particularly as becoming sort of the glue that holds together a renewable future. Because we can provide the firming power, the flexibility to make sure the system stays reliable as we put more intermittence on the system and learn how to balance the system out to perform. But really quickly, the world market, as I said, is growing strongly. The US market is not. And I'll give you a quick, quick note as to why the disparity. I'd say there's two reasons. First. There's an asymmetry right now in tax policy, which means it's very unbalanced. 2009, we passed a broad tax act, and many, many of those provisions have expired. They get, did, what, a two-month extender on the last package? Well, it's a real mismatch for geothermal, because we have long lead times for our projects. We need to have long lead term line times on, on tax incentives. And they need to be more equitable. You need to, the, we've supported moving towards a technology neutral credit based upon climate emissions because you need something which can have a metric as to why you're putting the technology out there and you're giving it across the board to everyone on the same basis or same, same, and same basis, but the same performance basis. The other thing that's happened in geothermal in the United States is bureaucracy has caught up with us. The NREL did a study looking at how long it takes to permit projects and geothermal projects are taking three times as long to permit as a major wind or solar project, a utility scale wind or solar project. We're taking twice as long as a natural gas project. So we've got about six bills right now in the Senate looking at how we can deal with some of these issues. And again, our problem is, is there going to be an energy bill? Will there be changes in the law? Many of these changes have been worked with some of the environmental communities so that they're not viewed as too extreme. But they would help speed up the process. Because when you take six to eight years to build a project, which you could build in three, you're almost doubling the price just because of the delays. So our hope is that we can get some of the different senators and congressmen who have introduced bills to help streamline geothermal and keep it in a balanced way, um, to work together on a bipartisan basis to have a geothermal provision in an energy bill, which we're at least still hopeful there's an opportunity for, or at least we're, we may find out in the next few weeks. So if we're moving geothermal forward in the US, we need to see tax incentives to be longer term and more, more across the board. And we need to have the, the bureaucratic time, lead times reduced, cut in half, so that you can build projects in three to five years and not six to 10 years. Thank you, Carol. Uh, that was not your signal, Carl, but anyway. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked. Totally discombobulated. But anyway, uh, but, but thank you so much. And, and I must say, you know, one of the things that I hope that everyone will take away from all of our, our panelists and our uh, expo today too, is how complementary all of these renewable and efficiency technologies are, that they are all part of a whole. We are blessed in this country to have an abundance of renewables 
and tons of opportunities all over the place in every sector to become more efficient. Don't, don't take things for just what they used to be. I mean, exactly. in, the, in the geothermal industry, we used to consider ourselves baseload power. And many of my companies were like, well, we're baseload power. That's important. Well, what if the utility commission needs firm and flexible power? Can you provide that? Well, yes, but why would anyone want it? You look at it and say, well, look, if the California Public Utilities Commission wants to pay you a lot of money to provide flexible power to firm the system, would you build the plant? I mean, we're in a new era, and the question is, what's possible? And when we went back and re-engineered, re-looked at geothermal plants and said, could they do this? The answer was, yes, they can play a much more comp complementary role to intermittent resources, and that's where I see, think the future is for them in the U.S. Which is, which is terrific. And I must say, in terms of if you talk to Carl or go to his booth too, the other thing I also wanted to quickly mention, because I know you didn't really have time to get into this too, but, but geothermal in terms of looking at direct use in terms of heating and, uh, and, and then of course geo exchange heat pumps, all different forms of, of geothermal energy. So there, mm -hmm. you know, which is available everywhere. Um, let alone the, the higher temperatures for this enormous reservoir of, of power potential. So um, now we will now turn to our uh, third speaker on this panel. Uh, and because we ran out of chairs, he's going to come to the podium to speak to us. And that's Dennis Loria, who is the Senior Vice President of Project Development with Greenwood Energy. And they do a whole variety, um, almost kind of, I would say, hybrid projects in terms of the different kinds of renewables and storage projects that you put together. Thank you. So I came in last. I didn't get a seat at the table, but I did get the podium. <laughs> so I guess that's pretty good. And I've got all my notes here, so I'm just going to say a few words and then hopefully save time for questions and answers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so Greenwood Energy is uh, the clean energy investment arm for the Libra Group. The Libra Group is a multinational um, uh, family-owned organization um, that uh, across six countries invests in transportation, um, energy, uh, real estate, and hospitality. So green energy, Greenwood Energy, excuse me, um, is an investor, developer in clean energy projects. We currently own uh, projects from uh, in the United States, uh, basically in the Midwest. I'm sorry, the Mid Atlantic and the Northeast. Those include CHP or um, combined heat and power projects, fuel cell projects, as well as solar projects. Um, our pipeline and our charter is to invest in projects throughout the Americas. So that includes the U.S as well as Latin America. Uh, we find we have a very large pipeline of opportunities right now, both in solar, wind, and energy storage. Um, so we are more or less an IPP, an independent power producer. We own assets. We sell power to institutions such as universities, municipalities, and private entities using clean energy. And we're able to provide savings to those organizations. Um, in terms of our message today, I think we encourage uh, policymakers in the U.S. to do three things um, to help our clean energy growth in the United States. Um, number one is to provide a smoother transition to the reduction in the investment tax credit. Um, number two is to provide more support for energy storage. We see energy storage as a key for the growth of renewable energy in the United States and throughout the world. And number three, um, to adopt the EPA's clean, ed clean power program. Um, we feel that having a smoother transition in the investment tax credit um, will help in industry plan better. Right now, we, we have a, a planned step change in the in investment tax credit at the end of 2016. We think it's important to smooth that, uh, that transition. Um, as I mentioned, energy storage is a key to the uh, increased implementation of renewable energy. And But like a lot of other new technologies that have been successfully implemented in the United States, both wind and now solar, um, uh, uh, energy storage right now is an expensive technology. It needs help um, to be successfully implemented. Um, and there's a number of, number of ways that the federal government can do that. And then uh, last but not least certainly is um, to adopt the Clean Power Program will help, help reduce uh, greenhouse gases for the United States, throughout the United States projected at over 30% reduction and an increase 
and also result in an increase in gigawatts, hundreds of gigawatts of new renew renewable energy. So um, just I'll keep my comments brief and I look forward to questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, uh, and at least as you said, you did get the podium, right? So uh, we will now turn to Ellen Levine, who is the president and founder of Hybrid Pedals, for which is another whole change of pace that we're going to go to in terms of looking at transportation. His exhibit A is right in front of the podium. Ellen. Hello, my name is Ellen Levine. I'm not a public speaker, so excuse me for that. I want to ask you all one question. How many of you know what an electric bicycle is? Raise your hands. How many of you can name one brand of electric bike that's not, that you don't see in front of you? One. One person. Right, okay. Quite, in, quite interesting, isn't that? Um, we've made our cities much more bike friendly. My job is to make bikes much more people friendly so that more and more people will ride bicycles. Uh, the electric bicycle laws, federal laws are very clear. You can throttle up to 20 miles an hour with a motor not to exceed 750 watts. So this particular bike here is kind of a high-end electric bike but it sure doesn't look like your grandfather's Oldsmobile. Uh, the battery's integrated in the body. What's really, really propelled this industry forward is the lithium ion technology in the batteries and the strength of the batteries. They're getting lighter and stronger with every, with every new shipment that we get from a manufacturer. We also build bikes for handicapped people, recumbents with motors, with controls wherever they need them. So we can put a handicapped person on a bicycle successfully and they can have a freedom they never had before. Um, how many of you are willing to ride a capital bike share bike uh, up Wisconsin Avenue or up Connecticut Avenue or up the Roslyn Hill from Roslyn to Clarendon? Anybody up for that? You. Three. Well, that's two more than new, new, new a brand of electric bike. <laughs> but it proves a point. Um, bicycles are great. And they're the, probably the most economical way to get around to commute. But there's 79 million baby boomers and a lot of people with physical disabilities that don't want to sweat on their way to work that need a mode of transportation that really works. These really work. Not only do they really work, but they're a whole lot of fun. A really bad day at the office for me is putting a smile on somebody's face because there's nobody that gets on the seat of one of these electric bikes and doesn't come back with a big smile on their face. Uh, to give you two examples that were recent, and I'll, I'll wrap up pretty quickly. It costs three cents to charge this bike to go about 40 miles. So when you want to talk about cost efficiencies, they're very easy to solar because they are storage of energy. They're batteries. You can go straight from a panel straight into the battery. So they're very, 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 very simple to store. I mean, for, to solar charge. So every single hospital in this country should have a solar trailer full of electric bikes. So if things should go south. Doctors, labs, they have a way to transport things. We have bikes with trailers and gurneys that can, that can haul people that weigh up to 400 pounds. That'll get a body out of harm's way faster than anything on Earth, except for a helicopter maybe. But it won't get shot down. Uh, one person can do the job of four in a disaster as far as movement of, of bodies. So we do the DOD shows. There's not a single bike on the GSA schedule. We're driving Humvees around a nature preserve at Camp Pendleton. And there's not a single electric bike on the GSA schedule. Isn't that remarkable? As much green as we talk. Now, I challenge all of you industry leaders in the sustainable energy field. Start walking the walk yourself. 
buy electric bikes for internal e-bike share programs for your own employees. Increase your efficiencies. Walk the walk, not just in what you do to make money, but in the efficiencies and, and what you do for your employees' health and the benefit of their lifestyle. And I'll end it with that. Thank you so much. Oh, by the name of the company is Hybrid Pedals, hybridpedals.com. Uh, free test rides. When we rent a bike before you buy it, and we got five star reviews all the way, and it's not just because of me. The product truly does sell itself. It's not a push sale, it's a pull sale. Um, great. Thank you, Alan. And so be sure and stop by this booth. Um, we'll now turn to Anne Germain, who is the Director of Waste and Recycling Technology with the National Waste and Recycling Association. Anne? Thank you, Carol. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, today about converting waste into a resource. So I've got a few questions. What if I told you that we could take the gas that's generated from decomposing waste and make energy or fuel from it? What if I told you that by making that energy, there would be fewer odors? And what if I told you that by making that energy, there would actually be fewer emissions of hazardous air pollutants? And what if I told you that doing this would lower our greenhouse gas emissions? Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. I'm talking about landfill gas. Landfill gas is formed naturally when the organic materials in our waste, such as food or paper, decomposes in a landfill. That gas that is formed is about half methane and about half carbon dioxide. The methane is the energy component of the landfill gas, and it can be used for a variety of beneficial uses. By capturing the landfill gas and turning it into energy, we can power homes and factories and even cars. Sometimes the trucks that pick up the waste and recycling are themselves powered by the trash that they pick up. So how does this work? After trash is buried in the landfill, the organic portion of the waste begins to decompose naturally, anaerobically, producing the gas. The landfill operators apply a vacuum to, through wells to collect um, all the gas. The gas is then piped into a compression and filtering station, and from there, it is sent to an end user where it will be converted into a valuable energy resource. <coughs> By capturing the landfill gas and converting it into energy, greenhouse gases and hazardous air pollutants are also controlled and reduced, creating a win-win combination, energy generation and emissions reductions. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, as of March of this year, 645 landfills in the United States currently have landfill gas to energy programs <laughs> in place. They exist in every state except for Wyoming and Hawaii. The EPA has identified an additional 440 landfills as future candidates for this landfill methane to energy program. Many prominent companies have already tapped into this valuable resource. For example, in South Carolina, a 10-mile-long pipeline delivers the gas from the landfill to a BMW production facility where the gas is used to fuel its manufacturing processes. Not only that, landfill, goes, landfill gas goes to Mars and to space. When I say Mars, of course, I mean Mars snack food. In 2008, Mars Snack Food Facility in Waco, Texas, the place where 85% of the Snickers candy bars in North America are produced, so a very important facility, started fueling its boilers with landfill gas from the Waco Regional Landfill. <clears throat> the switch was projected to save hundreds of thousands of dollars in natural gas costs each year, while also lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Closer to Washington, D.C., NASA also uses landfill gas to fuel space exploration. NASA anticipates saving more than $3.5 million over the next decade while they're heating 31 buildings at its Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, using energy from landfill gas. Not every project is large. 
Smaller applications have included using landfill gas to heat greenhouses to grow tomatoes or used in kilns to fire bricks. So what other kinds of energy can landfill gas be used for? As you can see from the previous examples, it's been converted into electricity and heat or a combination of both electricity and heat. But it can also be used to directly offset another fuel, such as natural gas, coal, or fuel oil. In addition, it can be turned into compressed natural gas, or CNG, and used to fuel cars and trucks. As CNG-fueled vehicles become more common, CNG from biogas, such as landfill gas, will also become more common. In the future, you could be fueling your car on trash. In total, as of March of this year, existing recovery projects produced annual amounts of energy equivalent to over 2,000 megawatts of electricity. And the EPA estimates that this is the equivalent of producing annual energy benefits powering over 1.2 million homes and reducing emissions equivalent to sequestering carbon in over 83 million acres of forest. And in addition, unlike some other renewable energy sources, landfill gas is generated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even if the sun don't shine or the wind don't blow, landfill gas keeps right on going. In fact, landfill gas recovery systems have an online reliability of greater than 90%. So in summary, landfill gas, it's a, lamp, it's a reliable source of clean, renewable energy that reduces air pollution and mitigates the impacts of climate change. The National Waste and Recycling Association appreciates the opportunity to share information about landfill gas as a valuable renewable energy resource. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks. Great, Anne, thank you so much. Um, and landfill gas really is pretty amazing. Um, and we've done some briefings looking at that too, and it's just amazing in terms of it becoming a real revenue stream for communities or companies, as well as making sure that we take advantage of all of these things that we waste, right? Um, so we're now going to turn to Seth Stolges, who is with Stein, where he is the Senior Marketing Manager. Seth? Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to briefly thank Carol and uh, Scott Sklar for putting on this event today. I've been coming for a couple years now, and it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. Um, so that's, that's really great to see. Um, my name is Seth Stolges, and I work for Stion. We are a U.S.-based solar manufacturer. Um, so today I'm just going to take a little bit of time and tell you about the current um, state of the market for U.S. solar manufacturers. I'll tell you a little bit how our technology differs from um, what has been referred to as a commoditized market. And um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects and the momentum that we're doing. Um, so we are a solar panel manufacturer. We're 100% U.S. owned and we produce our product here in the United States um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We are 100% backed by Kosla Ventures. Um, this is the venture, venture capital firm founded by Vino Kosla, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and we employ over 120 workers in the United States, and we are set to double the production of our facility in Mississippi over the next year. So there are currently less than a handful of solar manufacturers that produce their panels on U.S. soil, and we are starting to see demand for high-quality U.S.-made solar products increasing. Um, we're seeing this demand from residential, commercial, utility, uh, government markets, and particularly from the armed forces. So the armed forces actually have a mandate to use uh, solar products that are made in the U.S., and with their concerns over supply chain management um, and availability, uh, made in USA products should be used far more regularly. We're also beginning to see an international demand for USA made products. Um, believe it or not, countries such as Africa, Japan, um, when you see a uh, blade of a wind turbine fly off your wind turbine, you start to wonder about quality. And so we're seeing more and more of an interest over time as some of these products um, start to fail from other countries. Um, so a lot of people think all solar panels are made the same. Um, a lot of them are. Um, our technology is a little bit different. Traditional solar panels use silicon. That's the main ingredient. Um, our panel uses um, what's called a SIGS, 
uh, thin film product. Um, so SIGs is copper, indium, galenide, and selenium. Um, and unique to our thin film product, it's cadmium free, which is a toxic substance if not disposed of and used properly. Um, what's unique about the thin film process is it requires uh, far fewer materials, so that's why it's referred to as, as thin film. The film itself is actually thinner than traditional silicon, doesn't require as much uh, product going in, and <clears throat> It also has half as many steps in the manufacturing process. So our manufacturing process is um, about 95% automated, um, and that's what gives us our, our high-quality high product that we see. Um, so even though our product is produced in the US, it's competitive in price with foreign-made products, stuff we see coming out of China, um, and it's of a very high quality. Um, our panels actually produce more energy per watt than traditional silicon panels. And this is due to two reasons. One, there's absolutely no degradation with SIGS technology. So traditional panels lose about one half a percent each year. After 25 years, that's 10 to 15% loss in production. Um, we've seen no degradation over time with this technology. Um, our panels also perform better in hotter climates. So all technologies like cooler temperatures, a nice 70 degree day is actually the best day for solar. Um, but as the temperature starts to creep up, our panels will produce more energy than traditional panels, which start to not produce as much in the heat. So we were founded in 2006. Um, we've been producing panels since 2011. And we're really starting to, to see our market take off. Um, so we're working um, with utilities, Washington Gas and Georgia Power, just to actually finance some of our products, our projects. Um, we just last year uh, sourced panels for four different one megawatt sites in Georgia. It's about a $3 million project, so about $12 million going in there. Um, and given that we're in the southeast, um, the southeast solar market is actually starting to really take off. It's a little bit different than other markets. Most markets go residential, commercial utility. Um, in Georgia and some of the other southeastern states, because of the way policy is written, we're seeing um, some very large solar farms put in the ground. But that's good for everyone at the end of the day, because um, we tend to make more of an impact with, with being at scale. Um, there are some, some policy changes going on. Uh, Georgia did just pass net metering over the past couple days, so we expect the market to continue there. And Mississippi is in talks. Um, they're discussing net metering at a policy level as well. Um, and I should just mention, the, we're seeing more of a demand for, like I said, um, our product in international markets. Um, we're installing a four megawatt system. That's about a $15 million project in Mauritius, which is off the coast of Madagascar. And we expect um, the international market to continue to grow. Um, so basically, you know, in short, if, if you can buy a high quality made in USA product for the same price as, as a competitive product from another country, um, why not? And as we continue to see manufacturing jobs in the US move overseas, uh, we expect our facility in Mississippi to double over the next year. And we provide more and more jobs to Americans. And in turn, as we export product, can actually help lower the US trade balance internationally. Uh, terrific. That's a great story. And it's, it's wonderful to know that there's actually this kind of a manufacturing facility in the, in the southeast and in Mississippi. Um, we will now turn to our uh, final speaker, whom I think when all of a sudden, you said something about blades on wind turbines. Was going, <laughs> oh my! Um, and because we're now going to hear from Jim Riley, who is the senior vice president for federal legislative affairs with AWEA, the American Wind Energy Association. So, um, and we're delighted to have you here, Jim. Thanks, Carol. Right Appreciate it. Uh, I suppose I enjoy being in a theater in the round too. So for. For those in the back, uh, apologies that you're looking at the back of my head. Um, thanks for including us. Thanks for uh, this whole forum. I think this is an exciting program on the Hill, and it comes at an excellent time. The, the space around renewable energy is, uh, it, it, 
it's high energy at the moment. There's, uh, we just came from some conversations on the Senate side as the Senate is thinking about a tax extenders markup, and energy is the topic. Uh, for those of you who are in that conversation, you, you know what I'm talking about. So you, your timing was perfect. I don't know when you picked this date, but, but it's a good one. Let me, let me ask a couple of questions following up on, on Ann's idea. Um, what percent of electricity in the United States today comes from wind? This is just an average. Is it 1%, 5%, or 10%? How many say 1%? How many say 5%? What about 10%? Okay, well, the, the fives were right. We're just shy of a 5% average in the US today it comes from, from wind. Um, which state in the United States generates, again, on average, the most wind electricity? Is it, I'm going to give you three choices, Texas, California, and Iowa? Who says Iowa? Who says California? Who says Texas? It's Texas. Texas has more wind installed than any state in the United States. What... Well, we can get into the per capita, but if you go to, if you've been to, um, but what's fascinating to me is, as I looked at, go to Texas and I talked to my daughter, um, and she, she thinks of Texas as horses, oil wells, and the Dallas Cowboys, but it, it leads the country in wind production. What country leads the world in the amount of uh, electricity generated from wind? Is it Germany, is it China, or is it the United States? Who says Germany? China? United States. It's the United States. We generate more electrons from wind than any other country today. China has more wind turbines installed than any other country, but they don't know, or they're not being used as efficiently, and they're not delivering the electricity that is happening here in the United States. So this is, this is a real, when I, talk about wind as an exciting time in the US, this is it. We're, we're seeing this opportunity come into reality. Um, speaking of my daughter, she, she's five and a half, and she came by the office last week, uh, and she knows what I do, because I come home and I say, I help people build windmills. She thinks that's really cool, and she draws little pictures of them. And I, she'd been in my office for about an hour, sitting there, really quietly drawing. Finally, she looks up at me and she says, Dad, Dad, where, where did they build them? And she thought we actually built them at 1501 M Street. So I, I, I had to tell her a little bit about, about Iowa. Um, Iowa leads the country in terms of jobs uh, around the wind industry right now. So it is, it is the manufacturing center. Uh, Siemens and T, uh, TPI Composites and others have huge facilities there building wind turbines and parts for wind turbines. Um, the, the industry today is, if you go down the kind of middle corridor, the wind belt of the U.S., that's, that's where most of the turbines are, are operating. Um, yes, there's some in California. Yes, there's some in Maine. But really, we're centered in that section up and down from Texas to Iowa. Uh, and so when you think about wind, as we're bringing the cost down of the machines, and the cost of wind has fallen 58% in the last five years. So if you think about that uh, forecast going forward, we're on a, a trajectory that should, uh, assume it continues, it, it will make wind that much cheaper and that much more affordable for families and businesses around the US. But we're not there yet. We need things like continued growth on transmission, because where all of that wind is in Texas is a long way from where people are using that electricity. So. Uh, progress on building transmission lines, and that affects a number of our technologies, is critical. Uh, Carl and, and others mentioned the need for continued certainty on tax policy. Uh, wind has benefited from the existing tax policy at the, in the US, and it needs it to continue for some period going forward so that we can transition to something that is a, a competitive market, which I think down the road, we don't think that the uh, current system will be as necessary as it is today, but it has to continue for now. Um, I think enough's been covered, and the fact that many of you are here, wind obviously has huge benefits on the, um, not only on the cost, uh, during the 
a polar vortex two-ish winters ago. It's hard to remember how cold it was that day, but wind saved consumers in the Northeast and Midwest one billion dollars in electricity costs. A billion dollars in just 48 hours. People say, how did that happen? It was the fact that wind was generating and uh, utilities could move and purchase the wind contracts rather than buying what at that time was very, very expensive natural gas. You know, we were heating our homes with natural gas because we don't heat our homes with wind. Uh, and so the market was able to adjust and consumers saved a billion dollars, which, which is not an insignificant amount. Um, wind is also generating in some states as much as, on average, 20% of the electricity in states like Iowa, South Dakota, and Kansas, and it does that reliably. People say sometimes, well, is wind always there? Well, wind is always somewhere. And as the technology of the grid has improved, the operators are able to harness, if, you know, if the wind isn't blowing on this side of Iowa, it's probably blowing on that side of Iowa. And so the, the grid, as dynamic as it is, is able to deliver wind as a reliable source of electricity. Um, in some states, for example, Colorado, uh, there was a period last year where wind provided 60% of the state's electricity load for a short period of time. Uh, so you know, again, we're, we, are, we are here, we're growing, uh, we're currently supporting 73,000 jobs in the United States. Uh, AWEA, the trade association that I work for, has 1,000 members that range from General Electric, which is a small manufacturing company, um, down to companies that provide services out at the wind farms, provide the safety training to our workforce. Um, it's, it's a fascinating place to be, and I appreciate the chance to be here and tell a little bit about it. Terrific, because I'm sure there will be lots of questions for everybody. Because you've all been so good in terms of keeping to your time commitments and everything, we've got some time for real discussion with, with all of you. So any questions, comments? OK, we'll start here. Hi, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? All right. <laughs> My name is John Harris III. Um, I'm just an artist and activist. Um, I just had a question about how you all feel about um, hip energy, solar energy, because uh, you know the country, we're always talking about tobacco and the dissonance between tobacco and hemp products moving forward, because um, so much can be done energy-wise with hemp. So I just wanted to know what you all thoughts were and how you feel like that could revolutionize different industries, stuff like that. Who wants to comment or? I'm not touching that with a 10-foot <laughs> pole. <laughs> huh. Anybody else want to make any comment or whatever? OK, I guess we'll just let that one be there. And and we're glad you're here and thinking about all sorts of stuff, right? OK. Uh, Jim, did you have a comment? OK. Oh, could you just wait for the mic? There you go. Being worried about talking about industrial hemp is like being worried talking about O'Doul's. Uh, you you have way under a, a fraction of a percent THC in industrial hemp. And it does have a large number of uses and is very profitable where it's grown in pl other places, uh, in Canada, for example, where it's legal. Uh, one uh, can uh, make uh, chunks of car bodies uh, out of uh, it. Hemp has a very long uh, fiber, very strong fiber. It's why it's been made into rope and so forth for hundreds of years. Uh, and it really is an extremely useful uh, crop. It's, uh, it's uh, and would be a benefit to American uh, agriculture. Uh, the problem it's faced all along is people confusing it with high THC uh, uh, marijuana. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's quite possible to uh, separate them from one another. Uh, and uh, it's uh, quite possible to have a very useful uh, 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 growing uh, and non-intoxicating growing uh, of uh, industrial hemp. Great, thanks. See, there's always somebody in the audience or whatever that can handle almost everything. And there are several states that have moved forward because certainly prior to um, uh, up, up through World War II, it was a very, very, very important industrial crop. Great for clothing, too. to the Orkney Islands, uh, 
north of Scotland where they have a lot of wind. Uh, but what interested us was uh, the pushback uh, from developing it there. Uh, there was concern that the uh, farmers, the individual owners were uh, making profits for themselves and not contributing back to the community. And also a, a real um, dislike of, of the um, consequences of having uh, a windmill in the place. I wondered what you're doing about this and if it's a problem in the development of the industry. I've, I've not been to the Orkney Islands, so I can't speak to what's happening there. Um, Citing an industrial sized wind farm is not an insignificant experience. And the, uh, the companies that do it and do it well work with the states and uh, the communities to make sure that there's acceptance of the, of the farm. Um, the, it, in Texas, one of the, again, getting back to the stories there, why is there so much wind in Texas? The, the landowners there welcome the business. The, think about this, a, um, a, a ranch in Texas can bring a farm in, bring a wind farm in, put the turbines in, and that is, that is guaranteed cash flow to that landowner for the next 10, 20 years, whatever the contract is. And uh, <coughs> as part of the deal, that they might end up with better roads out to their farm. Um, and there's, there's a real upside. The, the farm is also, in, in most, in, each state does things a little bit differently, but usually they are contributing to the community, whether it's the, the, fire, the fire fund or the education fund, so that states really appreciate the, the royalty payments that are coming in. Um, but there are examples where wind has had a hard time. Um, the when you think about off of Nantucket is a case here in the US that is a, um, I think a, shows all of the challenges of bringing wind into a community uh, where again, sometimes it works. And I think wind has a lot of opportunity and is still being built in places where there is huge potential and support for it. Um, our members get calls every week from companies or from uh, counties that want to bring more wind into, into their area. So. Okay, thanks. Because I think it's one of those things that it really varies depending upon where people are in terms of the kind of, of um, acceptance and, and how things uh, progress. We have a question over here. Yes, I have a, I have a question about subsidies. Um, the individual types of renewable energy that are individually subsidized, or are they collectively given sub, uh, percentage of subsidies? And if they're not collectively given, why not do it as a group? I think it would be much more um, stronger. Uh, I have a stronger voice rather than individually um, lobbying or fighting for that particular type of renewable energy. Um, okay, uh, Carl and, and Jim, you should both respond. And of course, as they said, now is really the time. This is a very, very hot topic here on the Hill right now. That, that's exactly what I meant when I said right now tax incentives are very asymmetrical, but it's almost by happenstance. The 2005 energy bill was really the first time that Congress tried to put all the renewables into an incentive package. So we all got slightly different treatment, but they were all there. Since then, it's kind of faltered on and off. Right now, wind, which uses the PTC, geothermal, biomass, hydropower, are not eligible <coughs> because they, they lapsed last year. Solar went with the ITC, so it's still moving forward. So that's why it's right now very asymmetrical. But hopefully, the Senate Finance Committee is talking about changing that at least for the next year and a half, to even it back up. But more importantly, there's been a lot of momentum on Capitol Hill to do exactly what you're saying, which is come in with a technology neutral tax provision that's based not, not on just whether you're renewable or not, but on your performance in terms of greenhouse gases. So if you can show that you can, you can re replace carbon emissions, that'll, that'll vary your incentive based upon that, not what your name is or whether we like you. Because climate seems to be the driving issue, and I think climate will be the driving issue in the future. I think we're likely to see a move in exactly the direction you're saying. That right now there's still differences in stovepipes between technologies, but I think we're, we're going to be 
over the next few years, see a move towards a more uniform and more policy-oriented tax incentive package. But it does make it really important for policymakers to hear from people um, why this is really important and, and what people want our energy mix to be about in, in this country. Uh, did you want to add anything, Jim? No, I, I think Carl speaks uh, for the, the industry quite well. It, um, you, you point out the fact that it is a, a stovepipe system that we have today. A lot of people believe it could be more efficient. Uh, but getting from here to there, as the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee have tried, um, is no easy feat. So in the short term, the reality is we're going to continue something akin to what we have, maybe with some minor adjustments of dates, but um, I think you would find support for something more comprehensive. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, both, and then you, Alan. Yeah, and I, I just um, wanted to add real quickly, one of the, the benefits that solar's seen um, is that we got an eight-year tax credit. Um, a lot of other industries have um, had to fight for one or two year tax credits and you see a lot of boom and bust markets. So hopefully in the future, not only is there a, a bill that um, looks at all this, all the technologies, but also one that looks at a long term subsidy because it's really helped solar get where it needs to be. Um, that if in 2016 the investment tax credit does expire, um, the industry should be able to stand on its own at that point. Okay, and obviously we've seen a huge boom and bust kind of thing, which just is not healthy and doesn't work well for, for anybody. I know the charts that I've seen from AWEA before look like this giant sign curve. And um, so I think certainty has been a huge issue for all of the industries. And as Carl said, where there's a long, much longer period involved in terms of the building out, for example, of geothermal projects, it makes it really, really important that policies recognize all of this. Go ahead. I have a question for hybrid bikes. How much does that bicycle cost? I just came, uh, I just came uh, back from Holland, and they're hard. scary to try to uh, cross a street, given how fast they're going. But uh, does it go <laughs> up mountains uh, instead of just flat Holland? <coughs> and that's my first question. And I have a question for the thin uh, solar folks, too. You can get a very good e-bike for anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000. That particular bike right there is around $4,000. But that's a very high-end bike. <coughs> to answer your other question, was your question about hills or? Does it go uphill? Yeah, it completely takes away the hill anxiety of riding a bicycle. A lot of people love to ride down the hill to like the beach. Worth the money. <laughs> but they sure don't want to ride up the hill back from the beach. And that's actually how one of the companies was founded by the uh, retired president of Wynn Oil, Wynn Oil Company. Now, I have just a comment to add to that. Uh, it's interesting that if uh, I'm a one percenter and I buy a Tesla for $100,000, I get a huge tax credit. If I'm an average Joe and want to ride an electric bike instead of a, a fossil fuel vehicle, uh, I don't get anything. Uh, I think that needs to change. I think your average common commuter needs to be incentivized to some degree, to get out of their car and get on a bike. And to go low carbon. No carbon. No carbon. <laughs> right, right, right. I have a question also about <coughs> the, the uh, solar panels. I, I was very interested that at least eight times you said in your presentation, high quality, high quality, high quality. Is that your competitive advantage against foreign competitors like the Chinese? I would think also you're lighter, so they might have a competitive advantage to ship. I'm just curious what you mean by high quality. Is that part of your competitive advantage against foreign uh, producers? Uh, yes, it is. It is one of, um, one of the benefits. I, I think that... Um, There, I mean, there's a very small percentage of solar products made in the U.S. right now. Um, there are a number made in Europe, 
Um, but the majority of, of manufacturing is, is coming out of um, the Far East, particularly China, a little bit out of Taiwan. Um, and really the, the big difference, most, most Chinese companies, I don't mean to generalize, um, are using handmade uh, products. So these are giant warehouses where uh, men and women are literally hand soldering um, panels together. In these higher quality environments, particularly particularly like ours, where greater than 95% of the process is automated, um, it just really results in a, a much more standardized product across the board. Um, if you look closely at solar panels that are hand soldered together versus those that um, are made by machine, um, you, you can see the difference. And, you know, solar's really only taken off in the past eight years per se. And what we're starting to see is that different companies' panels are degrading more rapidly than others. Um, now, we've only really had panels out there for four or five years, so we can't say that um, there's going to be no degradation in our panels over 25 years. Um, but when we start to see certain products degrade 5 or 10% within the first couple of years, and we look at where they made, where they were made, and how they were made. Um, it it tends to point that, you know, how you make your product is very important. And when investors start to see that their re annual returns are um, diving in the wrong direction, um, and this goes for all technologies, um, then it really starts to to ring a bell. So. I have a feeling over the next five or ten years, it will really start to sort itself out um, over uh, which which products are higher quality. And there there are some very high quality uh, producers all over the world. It's not just limited to the U.S. Um, but I think we'll we'll see a little bit of a, a shake up and a shake out over time. Um, yes, I have a uh, two quick questions actually uh, for the landfill gas. Uh, I wondered how similar your technology was and how applicable it would be to, say, tapping into large-scale industrial farm waste uh, as sort of a biodigester. And I wondered if the uh, wind industry uh, might comment on stratospheric wind uh, tapping into the high upper atmosphere jet streams. Where on the scale from science fiction to actual implementation is that? Thank you. So um, with landfill gas, uh, converting waste into energy, it can, you know, it's the organic fraction of the waste that we're focused on. So if you can actually um, do additional separation and um, get a more uniform product, so like just doing food waste, like in California, what they're doing is um, rather than having it go to a landfill, they're um, sending it to anaerobic digesters where um, it's an enclosed system in a building. They're doing a rapid decomposition of the food waste and then they're pulling off the methane from that and then the food then is cured, waste is cured into a compost-like product which then can be used as a soil amendment. Um, so that's kind of uh, be the, probably the next step um, down the road. Uh, we're probably not there yet because it is somewhat more expensive than most people are willing to invest in. But um, yes, it's got some similarity with other biomass type um, conversion. Um, I, I had a question also on um, landfill gas. I think you indicated that 50% of the stream of gas coming out was CO2 and 50% yes. met, uh, methane. Um, what do you do with the excess CO2, or do you just burn a very low-grade gas, in which case the CO2 is, is getting into uh, the atmosphere? Yes. So um, the straight answer is that the CO2 is going out into the atmosphere. The way the... Um, EPA looks at the CO2 from landfills. It's considered a biogenic source rather than an anthropogenic source because it's from the degradation of a cellulosic material. So as long as it's not going under an increased value, so it's, it's the same as if you were going to compost. As long as the compost is releasing CO2, it's, it's considered part of the original carbon cycle. 
rather than coming from a fossil source and adding to the carbon cycle. But if it's going out as a methane, where a methane has a CO2 equivalent value of 25 times that of CO2, that's when it's considered uh, a contributor to the greenhouse gases. Does that make sense? There have been attempts by some people. Um, we've been told that CO2 has a lot of value, and um, I understand that uh, there's been talk that it could even be made into food grade quality. But whenever I ask anybody, they're like, no, no, not us. Because I, I don't think anybody wants to think anything in their food is coming from a landfill. So if, if it is used, I think it, it's kind of on the down low. Question for the whole panel. Um, I'm a, with a WGL Energy, we're a, we, we're, we invest in distributed generation projects, um, technology agnostic. Each of your vertical markets have their respective challenges, um, plenty of them. But if you collectively could combine forces, what policy issue would you tackle? What would, what would make making your projects easier to do? In my case, um, you know, if we want to create jobs, uh, people have, disadvantaged people have to be able to get to those jobs. So there should be some way that a subsidy could be granted to a job applicant who accepts a job that may not be on a public transit line or that may enable him to, to, to move forward in life and to progress in life, uh, especially those coming out, of, uh, uh, coming out of the military, coming out of the penal institutions. These people have very, very difficult times uh, because they can't find a job that's close to their home, and it's it may not be on a on a public transportation line. Uh, so I think getting some sort of a financing program working where it's somehow federally guaranteed for certain people would be quite beneficial to everyone. I think one of the things um, that you've kind of heard a little bit from all of us is uh, some of the tax extenders that we're talking about. I think what that does, and I think you've heard from wind and solar and geothermal about what some of that does is it allows um, the infrastructure and the technology to develop to a degree where the price point becomes competitive and economical, and that they can then compete on um, an equal footing. It's the development of a lot of the technologies and, and getting the price point down that, um, so that you know, the average person can take advantage of it, or a small town can take advantage of it. Um, when I was little, there was somebody that had some horrible looking solar panels that were a complete eyesore in their front yard, and um, they were enormous and now you look at solar panels and and they're so much smaller and um, I would like to consider them for my own house and it, it's it's getting from um, what it was to what its potential is um, is assisted by uh, any sort of tax breaks that we can get our hands on I can add my two cents to your idea I would say there's several different things that need to be done one is the states need to have policies that really look at the diversity of technologies and how they're going to move forward as a, as a whole. They're very short-term states right now. They're looking at, we're going to do this policy or this piece. They're not looking at how we're going to make a transition in our energy system, how do these different pieces fit in, and give us that sort of long-term threshold. You really need to, to play this out. I mean, I think solar is a great example of where you've got an eight-year tax credit. Long-term policy gives you the launch pad you need to really make a difference. Starts and stops don't work. And the states are the drivers on energy policy. You've got to remember that. So the state policies really formulate the basis of what you got at the federal level. You're really dealing with two main policies. One is tax incentives. But the other is transmission. And there's sort of an overlap there between the states and their regional transmission modes, which is going to become increasingly important for all of our energy needs, is to have a good, 
flexible, reliable transmission system that isn't, isn't stovepiped into the states, that isn't federalized, but has regional components to it. So I'd say regionalization, better rules of the road in the sense of transmission, longer term federal incentives, and state policies which really set the stage for transitions in their energy systems, looking at a variety of diversity of technologies. First, I think it's a great question, by the way. Um, really gave me uh, reason to, to think and pause. I think the biggest, you know, if, if we're really concerned about clean energy, we're really concerned about uh, global warming, we have to do something as a country. Right now, so much, you know, every, every state has a different incentive program. And so, you know, you can't put solar on your roof pretty much in Florida. Um, but, you know, you can, which is a sun, sunshine state, right, which is pretty paradoxical. Um, but, but you can in Massachusetts and a lot of other states. So I really think we need a, a stronger federal program, uh, for a stronger federal incent incentives, mandates, um, unless we line on individual states if we're really going to make progress in adopting more clean energy uh, in the United States. And good things have been said. The, the keys for, for wind, and I think for a number of these other technologies, is uh, certainty over a, over a long period of time. Um, and we, don't, we have not had that. And that's made the cost of our technologies higher than they could have been if we'd had certainty. Um, and uh, you know, looking at today's administration, today's Congress, um, I think we, we're focused on the tax extenders because that's what's, that's what's real. Um, I think we could have another discussion once we get through tax extenders about what's in tax reform or other programs that government may offer. But today, we have to pay attention to what's, what's on the table. Great. Thanks. Um, and I just wanted to mention, too, that it's important to think about how each of these things, again, works together in terms of policies. And oftentimes, it's not just one policy, but it may be a portfolio a blended suite of policies that may be necessary to really make things work. And Carl referred to transmission. I just wanted to mention that that with regard to thinking about policies, how important that is, and that there is that's going to come up on a later panel this afternoon. So I encourage you to, to listen in for that as well. So I want to thank all of our panelists, thank all of you for being here for this, and, um, and enjoy the expo. And thanks so much for coming. <laughs>